Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Westwick to the Distinctive Voices podium. Thank you, Ken, for the very kind introduction, very generous. Uh, thank uh, the Academy and the Beckman Center for hosting this great event, and thank all of you for coming out this evening uh, to learn about the history of the Academy. Um, there is more than popular interest, uh, the usual popular interest these days in President Lincoln, uh, propelled in part by Steven Spielberg's film. Uh, I haven't seen the movie, but I suspect it does not include one of Lincoln's many accomplishments. Uh, one may excuse this oversight since it occurred amid events then shaking the very foundation of our union. It also concerned a subject not always seen at the time as central to the American enterprise. But 150 years later, uh, sitting here surrounded by the fruits of modern science and technology, uh, we may better appreciate Lincoln's wisdom in creating the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, and here's a the famous painting uh, by Albert Herder. This scene, in fact, never happened. Uh, this is a reconstruction after the fact in the artist's imagination in 1924 uh, to portray the Academy's founders uh, from left to right. Uh, that's Harvard mathematician Benjamin Pierce, uh, Alexander Dallas Bache uh, in the back uh, from the Coast Survey, physicist Joseph Henry. Uh, let's see who's next. Uh, that's Louis Agassiz uh, standing next to Lincoln, the Harvard zoologist. Uh, Lincoln, of course, uh, Senator Henry Wilson, uh, on the other side, a Massachusetts Republican, uh, Charles Davis, a naval officer in the Bureau of Navigation, um, and at the end there is the astronomer Benjamin Gould. Uh, now, these people came together. Uh, the American scientists for years had floated, uh, floated the notion of an academy to recognize and promote American science. The Civil War had added a new angle. The government was flooded by proposals for new weapons uh, sent in by enthusiastic inventors. The Smithsonian, itself a relatively recent creation, reviewed a few of them but could not study them all. So a few of these scientists combined their idea of an academy to promote a science with one that could serve the national government. That is, the academy in a sense would have two masters, science and government, the assumption being that the two would naturally align. Now, the academy's history would test that assumption. Uh, so Charles Davis, uh, the naval officer, and Louis Agassiz, the zoologist, drafted a bill and submitted it to the Senate through uh, Senator Wilson from Massachusetts. Uh, the bill was a model of concision, I think, as Ken pointed out in his introduction. After giving the Academy the power to elect members uh, and set its own rules, it described the main function of the Academy in about 50 words, basically to render scientific advice to the government whenever called upon uh, without compensation, that unfunded mandate. Many years later, in 1947, Academy President Frank Jewett uh, called this act of incorporation an astounding document. It is one of the most, if not the most, sweeping delegations of power, coupled with obligation of service to the nation, which the sovereign authority has ever made to a group of citizens completely outside the control of political government. Uh, Jewett also noted that the act did not shackle the Academy to the problems or philosophy of 1863, and instead gave it the freedom to adapt to changing times. But loose language, as any lawyer might tell you, may also lead to confusion down the road. Anyway, uh, the bill breezed through Congress uh, without much debate, thanks to Senator Wilson, and President Lincoln signed it into law on March 3, 1863, the same day he signed the Conscription Act, requiring every male between the age of 20 and 45 uh, to register for the draft. Unlike the Conscription Act, the creation of the Academy did not spark riots in the streets. But uh, it did arouse misgivings among some scientists, including Joseph Henry, who protested the back door way the Academy was created. Uh, Henry sensed that Congress would have opposed the Academy, as he put it, as something at variance with our democratic institutions, and that it might be perverted to the advancement of personal interest or the support of partisan politics. The Academy, uh, he sensed, is a private organization with public responsibilities. It is a group of elite, unelected, unaccountable scientists directed to shape federal policies. At the very least, Henry intimated, this would expose the Academy to criticism. And Henry was right. Such, sus such suspicions have indeed sparked debates over the last 150 years, both inside and outside the Academy, over its proper role and function. But the other Academy founders were also right. The Academy has fulfilled its original purpose probably far beyond what these founders dreamed of. 
the food we eat, the roads we drive on, our health care, the education our children receive. There are a few areas of American life untouched by the Academy. The Academy's 150th anniversary gives us a good reason to reflect on its history. Now, it'll be hard to cover 150 years of history in an entire book, uh, let alone my talk here tonight. Uh, and the story is not just about this one institution. Rather, it is a story about American science and technology uh, and their role in American history writ large. Westward expansion and settlement, the shift from agricultural to industrial and then information economies, the rise of the U.S. from strategic backwater to global superpower, the national security challenges of two world wars, the Cold War, and terrorism, the growth of the regulatory state and the domestic reach of the American government, and the expansion of social and political rights to women and ethnic minorities, among many other stories. Just a few of those we'll touch on this evening. First, uh, as the title suggested, what's in a name? The Academy's founders picked a rather generic name, but the three big words in the title beg for definition. Now, they could have followed the example of the first scientific academy, the Academy de l'Insee, founded in 1603, what would become Galileo's intellectual home, and what is now Italy. Translated, uh, this means Academy of the Lynx Eyed, which is certainly more poetic than National Academy of Sciences. Uh, maybe they should have called ours the Academy of the Eagle Eyed. But let's start with the sciences. What does this mean, sciences? As Ken pointed out, the Congressional Charter directed the Academy to advise the government on any subject of science or art, unquote, which leaves a fairly wide open door. In practice, the Academy has interpreted this fairly narrowly, although this changed over time, reinforced by the natural tendency of members to elect like-minded colleagues. Thus, it has not, for instance, followed the lead of some science academies abroad and stooped so low as to let historians in. <laughs> Its original 50 members came mostly from natural history, the earth sciences, and astronomy, the fields of most American scientists at the time. Uh, today it has over 2,000 members across the physical and life sciences and including engineering, medicine, agricultural, and the social and behavioral sciences. Now this disciplinary broadening took uh, much time and some effort. For example, uh, the Academy long grappled with the relation between science and technology or between scientists and engineers. And trust me, historians are also grappling with this relationship. President Kennedy reminded the Academy on the occasion of its centennial that Tocqueville had a chapter titled, Why the Americans are More Addicted to Practical Than to Theoretical Science. The government naturally tended toward this practical point of view, which I think was Kennedy's point to the Academy at the time. Uh, but as American science found its footing in the 19th century, uh, some scientists had sought to elevate abstract research beyond what they saw as mere tinkering or inventing, tainted by the profit motive. Academy member Henry Rowland gave a celebrated speech in 1883 titled, A Plea for Pure Science, rejecting the tendency, as he put it, to call telegraphs, electric lights, and such conveniences by the name of science. Now, on the other hand, that same year, the Academy had admitted Alexander Graham Bell as a member. And just a few years before that, it had invited Thomas Edison to demonstrate his new phonograph. But it took another 50 years for Edison to be nominated for membership. And even then, he was rejected at first by physicists before finally making the cut. Now, this issue contributed to the first addition to the Academy structure uh, during World War I. Uh, once again, war increased the federal appetite for science uh, beyond what the Academy could provide. To bring more of America's growing scientific enterprise to bear on military problems, Astronomer George Ellery Hale and physicist Robert Millikan pushed for the creation of a National Research Council, which President Wilson called into being with an executive order in 1918. Uh, here is Millikan and a few others uh, in front of the new offices of what they call the NRC. Uh, that is Millikan, second from left, in military uniform. He was actually commissioned uh, into the Army at the time. Uh, the NRC, like the Academy, brought scientists from universities, industry, and government onto advisory committees uh, with no compensation. The twist here being that NRC committee members need not be members of the Academy. The NRC thus tapped the great and growing bulk of American science. The NRC at the time expressed science's longstanding tension with engineering, in part because Edison had created a competing board of inventors for the Navy. 
And there's a, a great story there about the competition between these two groups and things like submarine detection. But the NRC, by reaching beyond the small number of scientists in the academy itself, greatly expanded the academy's access to engineering expertise. Now, that did not satisfy the engineers in the long run. The academy's membership criteria stressed original research and publication, which tended to exclude engineers from industry. After World War II, with engineers playing key roles in the atomic age and space race, their limited presence in the academy rankled, and a group of them agitated for an independent academy of engineering. Academy scientists resisted on several grounds. For starters, where to draw the boundary between science and engineering? A separate academy would also perhaps lead only to fragmentation when greater unity of science and technology was what was needed. Finally, an academy of engineering, they prophesied, might lead to similar calls for academies of medicine, agriculture, and so on. Now, in 1964, the engineers indeed formed the National Academy of Engineering, uh, integrated with the NRC. And sure enough, medical doctors, similarly limited in the academy membership, and similarly spurred by growing social influence, in this case, uh, attention to public health issues in the 1960s, soon pushed for and got an Institute of Medicine. So together, the, what, the NAS, National Academy of Sciences, uh, NRC, NAE, National Academy of Engineering, and IOM, Institute of Medicine, together these four form what is what some call the National Academies Complex, uh, with the National Academy of Sciences I think first among equals uh, in this group in the govern uh, governance. The 1960s context also led to calls for a greater representation of social science. The academy had included ethnology as one of its original fields and then anthropology and uh, psychology in the early 20th century. In the early 60s, these expanded into a broader division of behavioral sciences. Some academy members in the natural sciences viewed the social sciences as soft, unworthy of inclusion, and there was substantial disagreement about further expansion. But as environmental pollution and military arms races, among other things, uh, drove increasing concern with the social implications of science in the 60s, the Academy approved an expanded division of social and behavioral sciences. And that's kind of how we got to where we are today uh, with this broad disciplinary representation in the Academy uh, across engineering, medicine, social sciences, and so on. Okay, so much for the definition of sciences. What about academy? What should an academy do? Although the charter stipulated that it pro would provide expert advice to the government, the academy also pursued the founder's other primary goal, the promotion of American science. Now, this, was, this function was partly served by the honorary character of the academy, uh, which provided prestige to members and elevated the st overall status of science. But the academy has also more directly boosted science uh, through several avenues. Uh, one is by organizing and supporting conferences. Um, and there are many examples of this, just to give you a couple examples. Uh, one example is the Shelter Island Conference in Theoretical Physics in 1947, uh, probably one of the most important conferences in physics in the 20th century, uh, reuniting the international physics community after World War II and also laying the foundation for quantum electrodynamics. Uh, this is a great photo from the conference. Uh, the, uh, Willis, across the back, it's Willis Lamb, Carl Darrow, uh, Vicki Weisskopf leaning over, uh, George Uhlenbeck, uh, Robert Marshak, um, Julian Schwinger, and David Bohm on the far right. Oppenheimer, of course, uh, resting on the uh, arm of the couch. And then Brom Pice and uh, Richard Feynman and um, Feshbach, I think, Herman Feshbach, uh, sitting uh, next to Feynman there on the couch. Uh, Oppenheimer later called this the most successful scientific meeting he ever attended. Um, times have changed a little bit. The conference was uh, pulled off for a grand total of $850. <laughs> times change. Uh, another uh, prominent conference, the Asilomore Conference of 1975 on recombinant DNA, uh, a milestone for bioethics. The guidelines uh, promulgated by this conference, I think, have shaped uh, genomics and biotech research ever since. Uh, here is a slide, Maxine Singer, uh, Morton Zinder, uh, Sidney Brenner, and uh, organizer Paul Berg on the right um, from Asilomar. Uh, that's Brenner again, and of course, James Watson, and uh, Joseph Sambrook and David Baltimore. Any of you molecular biologists might recognize uh, some of these people. Um, so Asilomar, Shelter Island, and you could multiply uh, those examples uh, many-fold. Uh, 
So conferences. Uh, the Academy also publishes research, uh, in particular the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or PNAS, first published in 1915. Uh, the PNAS has long been one of the most cited scientific journals uh, in any field, and it has published many seminal articles. Uh, Edwin Hubble on the expansion of the universe, uh, Barbara McClintock on the chromosomes of maize, um, Messelson and Stahl on DNA replication, uh, John Nash on game theory, John Nash Jr. on game theory, uh, and so on. Um, the Academy has also encouraged the production of new scientists, uh, most notably through fellowships to uh, many generations of uh, young uh, undergraduate and grad students uh, in American universities. Um, before World War II, uh, NRC fellowships to uh, such budding scientists as Oppenheimer, Ernest Lawrence, uh, helped underpin uh, the foundations, uh, actually underwrite, literally underwrote the American contributions to quantum mechanics and nuclear physics in the 20s and 30s. Um, and then after the war, NRC fellows included such future luminaries as Murray Gell-Mann, Richard Garwin, John Nash, uh, Daniel Koshland. Uh, James Watson uh, was actually on an NRC fellowship uh, when he worked with Crick uh, and discovered the double helix. Uh, the Academy has also shaped science training for younger students uh, through teaching standards for physics and biology uh, in the 50s and 60s and more recent efforts to boost science uh, in the K through 12 curriculum. Finally, the Academy represents the United States in the international scientific community. It provides a connection to science academies abroad, to international science unions, uh, to UNESCO. Uh, it sends American scientists to international conferences or for extended research visits in laboratories abroad and it invites foreign scientists on uh, comparable visits uh, to the United States. It has also organized international research projects, most notably the International Polar Years, uh, the most noted of which is probably uh, better known as the International Geophysical Year, IGY, uh, in the late 1950s. Uh, the IGY, of course, helped launch the space age. Uh, this is a famous uh, photograph from the evening when the first American satellite explorer uh, built in part by our friends uh, across the way, not across the way, but across town at JPL. Um, uh, this is uh, William Pickering from JPL, James Van Allen, the Van Allen belts, um, explorer helped discover those, and Werner von Braun. Um, actually, in a press conference in, some of you may recognize the hall uh, at the National Academy building on Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C. That's where this impromptu press conference was held. Uh, kind of an interesting story there. They were driving into D.C. in the middle of the night, like 3 in the morning. It's driving rainstorm. Uh, they don't expect to find anybody there because it's the middle of the night. Uh, they pull into the academy and walk into the hall, and there's this jubilant throng there to greet them. And this photograph was the spontaneous reaction to the three of them. They kind of said, what do we do now? This huge crowd there, and they held this thing up. Um, the engineers at JPL called this the deodorant shot. Um, <laughs> But why did they hold this press conference at the National Academy instead of at the White House or some other D.C. location? Uh, the answer, I think, is because the Academy uh, automatically, I think, or naturally means to most people, uh, it confers scientific legitimacy. And I think that's why they held it there uh, instead of at the White House or, say, the Pentagon, because they were trying to avoid uh, military associations for the early space program. So the Academy was a natural spot for the press conference. Uh, anyway, great photo. Um, okay, these works of the Academy, I think, are fairly well known. Conferences, uh, international representation, uh, fellowships, and so on. The Academy has had a tremendous uh, but less recognized influence on what we might call the nation's infrastructure, the things that support the everyday lives of Americans. And let's consider just two examples. In World War II, the Academy, uh, troubled by how poor nutrition might be undermining national defense, created a food and nutrition board. The board came up with what it called Recommended Dietary Allowances, or RDAs, which the board then consistently updated over the years. Now, these are the RDAs familiar to all of us, I think, from cereal boxes and other food labels. Uh, and they have determined what Americans eat ever since. A second example is transportation, which has long been one of the Academy's biggest efforts, uh, whether measured in terms of people or funding. We all know that President Eisenhower created the interstate highway system in the 1950s, in part to address the proliferation of automobiles uh, in American life, and in part to ensure military transport in the Cold War. What you probably don't know is that the Academy's Highway Research Board had independently anticipated the need for new highways uh, for both commerce and national security, and ran a multi-year $20 million test uh, 
of pavements in the late 1950s. The results of these tests literally undergirded the interstate highways and defined highway construction for the next 50 years. Uh, the Academy, in short, played a central role in the paving of America. And this is the test, the ASHA road test. Uh, the American Association of State Highway Officials, I think is the acronym, uh, and they built several test segments out in the plains of Illinois. Uh, this was just one of them. You can get a sense of the scale of this project. Uh, thousands of people, again, many millions of dollars spent on this over several years, uh, and they would just, they had these test loops, and they had all kinds of different sizes of trucks and cars that would just sit there and drive 24-7 for months and eventually years uh, to try to wear down the pavement. Uh, I think part of the straight part is now part of I-80 in Illinois. Okay, uh, one could multiply such examples uh, from nutrition and transportation, multiply them through health care, uh, telecommunications, education, uh, sex and birth control, and so on. The Academy has had profound influence on these most basic aspects of American life, and very few people know about it. Usually, the Academy's main function, advising the government, is more visible. How it works is uh, an agency of the federal government, usually the executive branch, sometimes Congress, uh, has a question or a problem. Examples might be, should we send the next robotic spacecraft to Venus or Mars or Jupiter? Uh, what are acceptable levels of automobile em uh, emissions? Uh, do computer exports cause a threat to national security? Uh, what should we do about stem cells? And so on. The government turns to the academy for an answer, or at least an analysis. The academy hands the question to the appropriate academy or NRC committee to, to study the issue and prepare a report. The agency pays for it, but here is the key point, uh, as Ken pointed out. Uh, the committee members are all volunteers. They get reimbursed for travel expenses, uh, but the government otherwise gets their advice for free. And this is pretty remarkable if you think about it. Some of the country's best informed experts on a subject who might otherwise command large consulting fees provide their advice for free out of a sense of public and scientific service. Now, these are very busy people, and studies are often time-consuming. Much travel across the country to these meetings, uh, drafting and editing reports. Uh, and the Academy is really a bargain uh, for the American people seen in this light. An outstanding question is whether the Academy is proactive or reactive. Does it just wait to respond to federal requests, or does it anticipate them? Does it wait for an issue to reach a crisis point, at which point it might be too late to do something about it? Uh, in other words, does it drive policy or does it follow it? There are several examples where the Academy has been ahead of the curve. One is computers. The NRC had a committee on calculating tables in World War II and another on computers in 1946 when the first digital electronic computers were actually just uh, emerging. By 1967, an Academy board was already contemplating what it called the public responsibility aspect of computers. That is, how vast databases raise troubling implications for personal privacy and information security, how large computer systems for, say, traffic control required stronger assurance of reliability, how computers had potentially nefarious social uses, such as for gambling. Uh, they even noted the potential, uh, since realized, alas, for what they called premature election predictions. <laughs> About a decade later, the Academy warned about the effects of electronic mail on the U.S. Postal Service. This was in 1979. 1979, the effects of email on the Postal Service. Uh, this is when the Internet was barely a gleam in Al Gore's eye. Uh, <laughs> speaking of the Internet, a subsequent 1988 Academy study toward a national research network uh, led to the 1991 legislation, yes, written by Gore, on high-performance computing and communication, uh, what became known as the information superhighway uh, that indeed fueled the 1990s internet boom. Okay, another issue of long-standing interest where the Academy was ahead of the curve, I think, is pollution. Uh, as far back as 1919, the NRC created a committee on sewage disposal, although its proposals at the time found no audience and no sponsors. The Academy found greater traction with a later concern over DDT and other pesticides. Um, in 1959, which is actually uh, well before uh, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, uh, it created a committee on pest control and wildlife relationships, including uh, much attention to DDT, uh, although not without controversy, uh, as we shall see in a minute. Now, pollution suggests perhaps the most potent example of current uh, Academy influence, uh, climate change. The Academy, in fact, engaged this topic back in the 19th century 
In 1878, 1878, Congress called on the Academy to assess the various Western surveys then underway and the plans for settling the frontier territories. This is one of the Western surveys at the time, the U.S. Geological and Geographical Survey uh, under Ferdinand Hayden, uh, surveying the uh, Wyoming territories uh, in 1870. Hayden is the one, uh, this guy is sitting at the head of the table. Uh, the photographer is uh, William Henry Jackson. Uh, he has snuck himself into the photograph at the far right. Uh, the painter Thomas Moran was also on this uh, survey. And some of his famous paintings uh, came out of uh, the, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, later, was later painted, but based on his experience here. Anyway, uh, at the time, the Department of the T Interior uh, allocated homesteads in 160-acre plots. Uh, but settlers were pushing past the 100th meridian uh, from the fertile Mississippi Valley into the arid Great Plains. Some current theories held that planting crops and trees would encourage rainfall, uh, hence the common saying, rain follows the plow. The geologist John Wesley Powell, veteran of several Western surveys, dismissed such notions and argued that small homesteads would fail in the drier plains and that only plots large enough for ranching or organized irrigation would survive. The Academy uh, convened the study and eventually sided with Powell against the 160-acre homestead. Western congressmen lambasted the ivory tower academics. Colorado Congressman Thomas Patterson argued that the Academy had never published but one work, and that was a very thin volume of memoirs of its departed members. And if they are to continue to engage in practical legislation, it would have been very well for the country if that volume had been much thicker. <laughs> Kansas Congressman Dudley Haskell declared, now, if you want a geographical survey, if you want a lot of astronomical figures, if you want a lot of scientific material, then organize your geographical surveys and authorize them to get out there and dig and hunt bugs and investigate fossils and discover the rotundity of the Earth and take astronomical observations. But if you please, while you are there acting in the interest of science and in the interest of professional bug hunting, leave the settlers upon our frontier alone. In this first encounter of climate science and politics, politics thus seemed to win. Congress kept the 160-acre land allotments. But Congress also followed the Academy's advice and combined the several Western surveys into a new U.S. Geological Survey, the USGS, uh, which became a powerful source for science in the federal government. And time would prove the Academy right. Rain did not follow the plow. In the 1880s, many farmers failed on the Great Plains, and only large irrigated lots survived, as Powell had predicted, and the Academy. These concerns continued into the 20th century. The first report of a new Committee on Atmospheric Sciences in 1958 raised the issue of climate change from atmospheric pollution, and it continued to engage the topic, encouraged in the 1960s by the budding environmental movement, uh, debates over cloud seeding in Vietnam by the U.S. military, uh, the debate over supersonic commercial jets, the SST, and their effects on atmospheric ozone. And of course, uh, since then, uh, the Academy has been a consistent and leading voice on the dangers of global warming. Uh, I think that story is uh, more or less familiar uh, to the public. But there have also been cases where the Academy was behind the curve and more reactive than proactive. I think 9-11 was one of them, although there it certainly had plenty of company. And other cases where it was conspicuously absent. Now, for instance, in the decisions to commit the United States to intercontinental ballistic missiles in the 1950s, the Atlas Missile, uh, and then to the Strategic Defense Initiative, better known as Star Wars, for missile defense in the 1980s. Now, I think it's no coincidence that the Atlas Missile and SDI were both defense programs. Uh, the Academy, of course, has long had extensive interaction with the military, uh, the Academy, of course, being spawned during the Civil War, the NRC uh, during World War I, uh, both played key roles in World War II. But science's increasing role in modern warfare ironically diluted, uh, perhaps, the Academy's influence. Heading from World War II into the Cold War, the federal government created a vast establishment to incorporate science. Uh, new agencies like the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, the Department of Defense itself, uh, the Office of Naval Research, the National Science Foundation, uh, later NASA, uh, with proliferating science advisory committees for each of these agencies, for each of the military services, eventually for the President himself, PSAC, uh, and Congress, what was known as OTA, Office of Technology Assessment, later on in the 70s. Uh, and the Academy at times struggled to find its place among this sprawling apparatus for federal science. <clears throat> 
Now that brings up the definition of national. And this is perhaps the most problematic word in the name. What does it mean to be a national academy? On a basic level, national might mean that it represents or reflects the American people. That is, if we ask who is the National Academy of Sciences, uh, we might expect it to represent the people. Uh, but for much of its history, if we ask who the academy was, the answer was uh, white men. Consider this photo of the annual meeting of 1874. Uh, Joseph Henry presiding there at the back. There's Henry. The uh, meeting was held at the Smithsonian. Uh, there are 48, picture, uh, 48 people in the picture uh, with five women. Uh, one of them, if I can find her, uh, Mary Henry is somewhere. Uh, I think she's over here. Uh, I can't really see from this angle. Mary Henry is one of them. Anyway, uh, the point is that none of the women were members. Um, the Academy did not elect its first female member until 1924. Uh, Florence Sabin, a Johns Hopkins medical scientist, uh, psychologist Margaret Washburn followed in uh, 1932. Barbara McClintock uh, was the third woman elected in 1944. Uh, at the time, of course, in that period, women were not well represented in American science uh, in general. Uh, three more women were elected in the next 15 years, that by 1960, um, uh, the number had held steady at, at three female members out of 600 total. Uh, the Academy elected its first African-American scientist in 1965, uh, the Berkeley mathematician David Blackwell. Uh, as American society at large expanded the opportunities for women and minorities, uh, so has the Academy, uh, which today has about 10 percent, I think, female membership, uh, give or take, although some in women scientists would say that proportion uh, still lags the presence of women in American science. Uh, the Academy has also worried about the age of its membership, especially amid the 1960s upheaval uh, as the baby boom swelled the ranks of American science with young PhDs. Academy leaders worried that they were losing touch with the younger generation. At the time, the median member's age was 62. Of course, there's good reasons. Uh, you have to attain specific stature before election and so on. But with only seven members under the age of 40, at a time when hippies didn't trust anyone over the age of 30, uh, the Academy risked a reputation as a bunch of fuddy-duddies, or as one member put it more charitably, the Academy was venerable. <laughs> Finally, in the Federalist American system, the Academy had to pay attention to geographic representation, uh, balanced with its desire to represent the elite of American science, who were disproportionately concentrated in a handful of top schools, especially in the Northeast, uh, maybe across the top of the upper Midwest uh, and the West Coast. The fact that we're gathered here this evening re uh, reflects these concerns. Back in the 19th century, Ivy League scientists had worried that the Academy, thanks to its location, was dominated by government scientists and an inside Washington worldview. This is before the Beltway, but uh, kind of inside the Beltway worldview. Uh, in the 1980s, the Academy created the Beckman Center here in Irvine, uh, to redress this East Coast imbalance. Uh, the fears were that the U.S., the Academy's view of the U.S. was sort of like that famous Saul Steinberg cover of The New Yorker, uh, where looking west from New York, there's basically nothing but a vast wasteland beyond the Hudson. Uh, for the case of the Academy, it would be looking past the Potomac. Uh, there's nothing out there. Um, so that was the goal of, uh, uh, basically the reason we're here tonight, is that they're trying to uh, redress this Balance. Of course, there's another local connection with the Academy, which I can't resist mentioning, in the person of its current president, Ralph Cicerone, uh, the former UCI chancellor, who's probably many of you know uh, in the audience here. Uh, he may be best known around here not for his research on climate change or his scientific leadership, uh, but for bringing back baseball to UCI, uh, which is now played across the way here on, yes, Cicerone Field. <laughs> it's not bad, you know? He is, a, he is a baseball nut. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Uh, but I digress. The basic point here, um, the Academy was an unabashedly elitist body within a democratic system. When a former government lawyer called for public access to um, uh, Academy deliberations in the 1970s, Academy President Philip Handler responded, we choose the members of our committees with extreme care. We have no sense of participatory democracy. This is an elitist organization, sir. <laughs> On an equally fundamental level, a national academy should serve national interests, 
Although the Academy from the outset enjoyed a degree of autonomy, it has not been insulated from the larger sweep of events, nor should it be. Its function, after all, is to advise the government on pressing issues of the day. The price for engaging major policy issues is exposure to the buffeting winds of democratic politics. Let us take a whirlwind tour through the last 150 years. The initial years reflected the Civil War context. Among the first requests for advice were two from the Navy concerning the new ironclad ships, then revolutionizing naval warfare. Um, essentially, one was how to get magnetic compasses to work amidst all this iron, and the second was how to keep the iron from rusting uh, in seawater, saltwater. But the first couple decades of the Academy were not distinguished. At the time, only the Coast Survey, Naval Observatory, uh, maybe the Army Corps of Engineers, maybe the Patent Office had any interest in science. Um, there was otherwise little federal interest in science, and hence federal interest in the Academy. So after a flurry of initial requests during the war for advice, uh, the Academy waited for requests and waited and waited. As the Academy approached its 25th anniversary, it seemed destined to become a moribund honorary society, barely able to afford publication of obituaries for deceased members, let alone encourage research or advise the government. But the Academy even then was finding its feet. As we know, the Academy was already deploying the earth sciences to shape federal policies for westward expansion. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, it helped develop physical and chemical standards for the second industrial revolution. That is, the, the emergence of science-based electrical and chemical, chemical industries on the new frontier of the laboratory. In World War I, NRC panels took on projects as, such as artillery location through sound and flash ranging, uh, U-boat detection, submarine detection, uh, intelligence testing, and a host of other military problems. Uh, this is a number of Army recruits taking an intelligence test developed uh, by a, an NRC committee uh, led by Robert Yerkes, um, the, what became later known as the uh, IQ tests. Uh, provide a wealth of data for um, not only social scientists but also for the eugenics movement. Um, this is uh, an acoustic airplane detector, uh, so you can hear airplanes coming before you can see them. <clears throat> uh, there were all kinds of ingenious schemes tried out during the war uh, for submarine detection, uh, not so much on the American side, more on the British side. They tried to train uh, trained SEALs uh, to follow submarines. They also tried ejecting bread out of submarine per periscopes to train seagulls to flock to submarine periscopes so that you could uh, detect them. Um, uh, there was another uh, form of acoustic detection uh, for uh, locating artillery, which is basically a system of microphones on the Western Front. You detect the passage of cells over the shells over these microphones and triangulate to find uh, locate the artillery. Uh, the record from these uh, microphones, by the way, provide one of the most chilling testaments uh, to the senselessness of the war. This is the sound record from uh, November 11th, 1918 at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the left side, this is 11 a.m. right there, armistice, the moment of the armistice. The guns are firing full bore right up to 11 o'clock, and then they fall silent. Okay, that's World War I. Uh, in the 1920s, the Academy helped restore the international system after the war uh, while engaging issues such as intelligent test, intelligence testing and sexual reproduction in connection with the acceptance of evolution, uh, the eugenics movement, uh, and feminism. In the 1930s, it brought science and technology to bear upon the problems of economic recovery. Uh, World War II, it remobilized for war, playing key roles in the atomic bomb, uh, medical research, uh, biological warfare, and many other programs and so on, uh, through the early Cold War, uh, including, by the way, several brushes uh, with McCarthyism, uh, the social upheaval of the 1960s, uh, the energy crisis of the 70s, uh, in the 1980s, things like arms control, also the AIDS crisis, um, biotech and uh, the internet in the 1990s, and on through 9-11, uh, climate change, and other issues in the last decade. Now, the Academy has weighed in on these and many other pressing, pressing issues in each period. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, I think, why this history is, the history of the Academy is so interesting uh, and, I think, important for American history. There are a few topics that the Academy did not uh, engage, and telling a story really means learning about the entire sweep uh, 
uh, of the history of American science technology. Now, at times, the Academy has clearly shaped public debate, but at other times, it has struggled against powerful political interests uh, or wielded little influence, thanks to the frequent tension between disinterested technical advice uh, and the dynamics of the American political system. Now, let's just briefly consider one example uh, from the 1960s in the Vietnam War, uh, when American society increasingly challenged all sorts of authority, uh, but especially scientific authority. Uh, science became associated with environmental pollution and also uh, the US military and arms races and corporate industry. At the start of the 60s, um, ecologists had slammed an NRC report on pesticides as extremely disappointing, completely inadequate, and a whitewash, with one reviewer accusing the committee of being in the pocket of the chemical industry. The ensuing decade dragged the academy further into debates over science and power. In 1970, Stuart Udall, who had been Secretary of the Interior under Kennedy and Johnson, charged that the academy was all too often a virtual puppet of government uh, rather than an independent critical voice. Uh, the science reporter Daniel Greenberg followed up in the journal Science. As he put it, the National Academy of Sciences has become a tool of vested interests. A subsequent book by Philip Boffey uh, in association with Ralph Nader examined academy studies of radioactive waste, uh, herbicides in Vietnam, the SST, food supply, pesticides, and it similarly concluded that the academy was an instrument of the prevailing power structure. These charges were not just made by outside critics. A few academy members resigned in this period amid tumultuous meetings to protest the academy's advice to the military during the Vietnam War. The most prominent was the biologist Richard Lewontin, who argued eloquently and passionately against military associations, at one point asking, is the academy really just another RAND corporation? Now, there was a basic principle at stake here. What should academy members do when they disagree with the policies of the government they are directed to serve? What does a national academy do in such situations? Should it stand on principle and refuse to serve, which would thereby violate its charter? Or compromise the ideals and work within the system? To put it another way, should the academy exercise moral and political as well as technical leadership? Can one separate technical issues from moral and political considerations? Some academy members recognize that refusal to get involved in charged issues or take strong stands might relegate the academy to the sidelines. James Van Neel uh, expressed, as he put it, the frustration many of us feel in getting the academy to where the action is as an alternative to going the way of the French academy. Now, the Paris Academy of Science is being seen in this view as just a strictly honorary society. This, I think, was implied in Handler's response to Udall. The academy, uh, Handler pointed out, had submitted reports on the environment to Udall's Secretary, uh, Department of the Interior, uh, but the Interior Department had ignored them, although in retrospect, uh, this might sound dangerously close to a plea of not guilty by virtue of irrelevance. Handler, in fact, though, agreed with Udall in a larger respect. Udall had called scientists political eunuchs, robots indifferent to the human consequences of their work. Handler, too, thought that scientists ought to engage the issues of the day. Handler maintained that since the academy was neither a private corporate body uh, nor an agency of government, as he put it, we are free to be both servant and critic of government. And he argued emphatically that the academy indeed had moral responsibilities. And he persuaded the Academy's Council to begin uh, setting up a committee on what it called moral leadership. Now, this episode highlights that the Academy is by the government and for the government, but not of the government. It is a private agency with a public purpose. This gives it the particular advantage of independence. The Academy's integrity stems from not being associated with a particular agency uh, of government or a particular branch. So it is not seen as representing a particular interest. But as Handler perceived, public advocacy on pressing social issues could undermine the Academy's independent image, which is the very source of, I think, its strength. So this precarious position between private and public and between neutral expertise and political engagement has required constant balancing. So here we are, 150 years after Lincoln created the Academy. What if he hadn't signed the bill, or the Senate hadn't approved it? If the National Academy did not exist today, would we want to create it? 
Some of Joseph Henry's initial misgivings still stand. How to justify an elite institution in a democratic society? How ensure objective technical advice untainted by particular political interests? And we live in different times. The two original purposes, serving American science and serving the American government, appear much differently today than they did in 1863. American science, for starters, is no longer a backwater. On the contrary, the US is now a scientific powerhouse, thanks in part to the academy itself, and the challenge is to remain on top, not to get there. And unlike in 1863, the federal government now makes abundant provision for science, with multiple funding streams, many agencies, with extensive scientific staffs and advisory committees, <clears throat> and a science advisor for the president himself. So why do we need one more scientific body advising the government? But one can turn this around. All this federal science only makes it more urgent to have a source of independent, objective advice from outside the government, not representing the bureaucratic interests of a particular agency or branch of government. And controversial issues, from climate change and creationism to stem cells, continue to call for credible expert judgment. One may also ask whether a deliberative body like the Academy has the time to deliberate in today's instant reaction world. Now, people were complaining about the increasing pace of modern society uh, 150 years ago when the Academy was created. But the communications and information revolutions uh, products of science and technology have indeed collapsed time and space. And Cicerone and other Academy leaders have noted that it usually takes one or two years for the Academy to complete a study, uh, by which time the issues may have changed. But again, you can turn this one around too. Uh, in a sped up world, deliberation may be a virtue. Uh, it is good, I think, to have someone taking the time to think deeply about some of these problems. Answering such questions ultimately re requires a value judgment. Has the Academy been a good thing, providing objective advice to the government at very little cost? Or is it just another tool of powerful political interests, as critics have occasionally charged? Of course, there is the third possibility that the Academy really hasn't mattered, uh, that it assembles scientists for these various studies, uh, releases their reports with great fanfare, and then the reports get filed away unread, uh, at least until historians dig them out decades later. And that is the challenge for us historians uh, when we come across these reports and these studies and the committees and the work they do. Uh, and that is to gauge the impact of them. What impact did they have? Um, did they nudge the vector of policy one way or the other? As Ralph Cicerone might put it, what is the Academy's batting average? So what difference has the Academy made? Would 20th century science or American society be different without it? I think the Academy certainly shaped the landscape of science uh, by legitimizing particular disciplines uh, and perhaps neglecting others. Uh, it boosted fields such as quantum physics uh, through the NRC fellowships in the 1920s. It's boosted molecular biology, uh, biochemistry, uh, more recently through the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is a very important form for these publications. Um, uh, there are other fields where Academy influence is clearer, I think, uh, though perhaps not always publicly visible, uh, in things like science training, uh, international science, science conferences, um, and what I call infrastructure. Uh, that is, the more mundane aspects of daily life, uh, such as transportation, nutrition, healthcare, uh, education standards. And the Academy has provided valuable judgment on pressing issues uh, in times of peace and war, in times of bounty and scarcity, from the frontier of the American West to the frontiers of cyberspace and genomics. So, did Lincoln get it right? The fact that the Academy has survived for 150 years suggests that the American polity still sees a reason to sustain it. And the fact that all of you came out this evening uh, to learn about this history further suggests that the idea of the Academy uh, continues to engage the American public. Maybe we should make a movie about it. Thank you. <laughs>